Hello everyone, welcome to Physics Wala English YouTube channel. I'm Chalni Somshekar, your botany teacher. And in today's lecture, I'm going to be summarizing one of the most important chapters of your second PUC syllabus or your 12th grade syllabus, which is called Principles of Inheritance and Variation. This is a very important chapter, keeping in mind your board exams as well as competitive exams like NEET. And having conceptual clarity in this chapter is of high importance because sometimes if you don't understand the concepts properly in this chapter, you might find difficulty in understanding some of the other chapters that follow. All right. So without any further delay, let's get today's session started. We'll begin by learning about what genetics means. How can you define genetics? I'm sure all of you have heard of the term repeatedly, right? So what is genetics? Genetics is that branch of biology which deals with inheritance and variation. Now, what is inheritance and what is variation? You've heard of the term inheritance in general English, right? Forget about what it is with respect to biology. You may have learned how somebody inherited their grandfather's property, somebody inherited their uncle's house and all of that. Basically, inheritance means something is getting passed on over generations from one generation to the next generation. In genetics, we're going to learn about how characters that parents have get transferred to the progeny. So if you were to define inheritance, it is the process by which certain characters are passed on from the parent to the progeny. Progeny is basically the offspring or the children. Okay, so uh, the basis of heredity is inheritance. Now, what is variation? Variation again in general English means differences, right? So if you see, even in your own houses, if you have siblings, Though siblings are born to the same parents, they don't look identical, right? There is some degree of variation among siblings unless they are identical twins. And there is difference between you and your parents as well. What is the degree of that difference is what variation is all about, okay? So the degree by which the progeny or the children differ from their parents is what we call variation. So here we will learn about what is the basis for that variation, why does that variation take place and also about how, what are the different uh, rules that govern inheritance of characters from one generation to another, okay? So that's all this chapter is going to be all about. This is a very lengthy chapter, equally important chapter like I already mentioned. So I want you all to sit down in a quiet place with your notebook and pen and undivided attention so that you can take maximum out of this lecture. Okay, so let's begin by talking about Mendel. I'm sure you all have heard about Mendel. Though this is a chapter in your uh, 12th grade, I'm sure in your lower grades, 9th grade or 10th grade, sometime in your school, you may have learned about Mendel, have heard his name. I'm sure you know that he's called the father of genetics, right? There is a reason he's called the father of genetics because he kind of laid the uh, foundation stone for the study of inheritance, right? So, Gregor Mendel, he worked on garden pea plant, okay? He was living in a monastery. There was a garden right next to his monastery or within his monastery. And then he grew a lot of pea plants and he was trying out uh, hybridization experiments, making use of pea plants. And he was trying to figure out what are the different ways or is there any uh, general rule that governs how characters are passed on from one generation to the, to the next generation. Alright, so based on his observations, on his experiments on pea plants, he proposed certain rules of inheritance in living organisms. He said these are some rules that govern how characters get passed on from one generation to another. Later, much later, after his work got published, after he passed away, his work was rediscovered and we call them the laws of inheritance now. Okay, so he worked on garden pea plants and he conducted hybridization experiments, I told you. What is hybridization experiment? You've learned about it in sexual reproduction, flowering plants, artificial hybridization, where you choose uh, plants that have specific traits of your choice and then you artificially pollinate them so that you get the desired, uh, you hope to get the desired uh, combination of characters from that cross. Okay, so that is what he tried to perform by making use of pea plants. And he worked on his experiments without giving up for seven years from the year 1856 to 1863. So he's worked for a really long period of time, performing crosses repeatedly one after the other and trying out and kind of 
um, you know, verifying if his observations remained consistent for different characters over many generations and all of that. He is rightly called the father of uh, genetics. And another thing about Mendel is that he is the first person to have used statistical analysis and mathematical logic to solve problems in biology. It's very rare that you encounter biology and mathematics intersecting, right? Usually mathematics and physics go together, biology and chemistry, there is a little bit of intersection. But math and biology, not that much really. But he is one of the people who tried to include statistical analysis and mathematics in order to solve problems in biology, okay? And another thing about his experiments, why they are so credible is because his sampling size was huge. He did not take two plants and perform an experiment and say, okay, this is the rule. Everybody has to uh, accept that this is how inheritance happens. His sampling size was in thousands. He had thousands of plants. He repeated those experiments for thousands of plants. He verified those results and then he gave his observations, which we now call the laws of genetics or laws of inheritance. Okay, Because he had a huge sampling size, his data got greater credibility. Also, he confirmed his inferences by conducting experiments on several generations because he kept conducting similar experiments one generation after the other, another uh, by having a large sampling size. His results were believable. They were very, very credible. All right. So these are some things about Mendel. I'm sure all of you all have learned about monohybrid cross, dihybrid cross, all of this in your lower grades as well. In today's lecture, since it is a summary lecture, I'm not going to get into the minute details of it. So let's just quickly revise everything. I'm going to cover all the concepts without a doubt, but it's not going to be like very detailed. I will briefly explain it to you all. So there's not going to be much writing, drawing of Punnett squares and all of that. I have all of the information on the slide. We're going to brush through it and glance every chapter. Okay. So, yeah. Now, when he worked on, Men, uh, when Mendel worked on pea plants, he was looking at certain characters. Okay. For example, the height of the plant, the color of the flower, the position of the flower, the color of the seed, the shape of the seed, the color of the pot, the shape of the pot. So these are certain characters that he was studying in pea plants. Now each of these characters that he studied were present as two strongly contrasting traits. Either the plants used to be tall or they used to be dwarf. Tall is like around 6 feet in height and dwarf is around 2 feet in height. Okay, so that's not mentioned in NCRT but I'm just giving you so that you get like a mental picture. So they were contrasting traits. Similarly, if you consider the color of the seed, it was either yellow or it was green. So there was no intermediate. Okay, so he was working on characters that had opposing contrasting traits. Each character that he studied had two contrasting traits. Okay, so that is one thing we have to understand. He conducted artificial pollination or artificial hybridization in order to perform his experiments. To begin with his experiments, every time he performed his experiments, there were three common steps. Okay, regardless of whether it was monohybrid, dihybrid, trihybrid, whatever genetic crosses he performed by making use of pea plants, there were three common steps. In the first step, he takes two plants. They are called the parents, right? That is called the parental generation. In short, we write it as capital letter P. First thing he does is, of the two parents, one of them is homozygous dominant, the other one is homozygous recessive. Now, it's important for us to understand what homozygous term means, what dominant and recessive means. Okay, so let me explain it to you in this way. Homozygous uh, dominant or homozygous recessive plants are also called true breeding lines. What that means is, before those plants are chosen as parents, he would have self-pollinated them for multiple generations. Okay, so he takes two pea plants. One of them is dwarf, one of them is tall, let's say, considering the character of height. He self-pollinates them. That means he allows them to undergo self-pollination and then he gets seeds out of it. He sows those seeds, those plants will uh, germinate and then form a plant. He allows them to undergo self-pollination. Then you get seeds, you sow them and allow them to undergo self-pollination. So he did this over many years such that 
the tall plant if you get a uh, seed out of that tall plant and sow it it will for sure give you a tall plant if you take the seed of that dwarf plant which has which has been self pollinated for multiple generations and sow that seed in the soil that will for sure give you the dwarf plant those are called pure lines what homozygous means i'll tell you in a little while so what he does first is he takes these homozygous dominant and ho uh, wait pure lines pure line tall and pure line dwarf plant first they are the parents so the parents are two opposing or two contrasting traits they have okay then he performs artificial hybridization so he cross pollinates them after that what you get is called the f1 generation okay first filial generation we say that is called the f1 generation once you get the f1 generation he allows those f1 generation plants to undergo self pollination once they get self pollinated he will look at those progeny and find out what is the genotypic ratio and what is the phenotypic ratio this is what he does for his mono hybrid cross as well as di hybrid cross okay so first he has to make sure that there are true breeding lines right the homozygous plants are available so basically like i already mentioned he selected several characters which had two opposite traits let's take a look at those seven characters when i say character what i mean is the height of the plant the shape of the seed the shape of the pod the color of the seed color of the pod position of the flower color of the flower these are characters most students get confused between characters and traits character is what you see here in this column the seed shape seed color pod shape pod color fruit color i'm sorry flower color flower location and the height of the plant. so these are the characters that he considered okay so what you have here in this column are the characters each character has two opposite traits contrasting traits the shape can either be round or it can be wrinkled seed color can be yellow or it can be green pod shape can be inflated or it can be constricted pod color can be green or yellow flower color purple or white flower location axial or terminal plant height tall or dwarf okay so here you have to see how there are two characters for seed two character for pod you know pea plant belongs to fabaceae there the fruit is called the pod right so two characters for pod two for flower and one is for height so he considered these 14 traits for his experiments all right it's important for you to remember all of this now let's move on inheritance of one gene this is also referred to as mono hybrid cross what does mono mean mono means single or one right mono means one hybrid is when you performing a hybridization experiment okay over here we performing artificial hybridization so this is called mono hybrid cross why is it called mono hybrid is because while performing a mono hybrid cross you're looking at you're focusing on one character with two opposing traits you don't care for example here you see we're focusing on tall and dwarf in these plants when you check the parents you check for whether it is a pure line for height you don't worry about its seed shape its seed color pod color pod shape what color flower it has none of that matters so while you're performing a cross we are considering just one character so it is called a mono hybrid cross okay so what he does first is in the parental generation which we represent by p he takes a tall plant and crosses it with a dwarf plant you have a tall plant you cross it with a dwarf plant what do you get as a result once you perform artificial hybridization pollination will happen seeds will form right the seeds you take and sow you get the next generation that is called the first filial generation or the f1 generation this is like the millennials this is like the gen z okay so this is the next generation so what he noticed was when he crossed a tall plant with a dwarf plant all of the plants that he got in the f1 generation were tall of the two opposite traits 
contrasting traits only one expressed in the f1 generation dwarf nature you could not see at all all of these were tall what he does next he allows them to self pollinate whatever progeny you get as a result of self pollination of f1 generation is called the f2 generation in f2 generation he got tall plant tall plant tall plant dwarf plant here we don't mean, mean to say that he got four plants he got tall plants and dwarf plants in the ratio 3 is to 1 these parents were not dwarf themselves they were tall but how did this dwarf character that was not in the parents reappear this is the doubt that he had and he performed similar experiments by making use of other characters as well and he concluded that i'll tell you so what his conclusion is based on this he proposed his rules which we call the laws of inheritance i'll get to that in a little bit over here when we talking about this just remember that the phenotypic ratio here is 3 is to 1 the genotypic ratio is 1 is to 2 is to 1 now what is the phenotype what is a genotype this is important for us to understand i'm sure you would have learned about it in your lower grades but let me remind you once more phenotypic ratio is what you can see observable character external feature whichever character we are considering that is the phenotype the expression what has been expressed that manifestation of that gene that is the phenotype genotype is what you cannot see it is the genetic component or the genetic complement of that particular trait which is present in the dna okay so here why did i say this is 1 is to 2 is to 1 let's give these plants let's represent them by making use of alphabets and then we'll understand how this cross proceeds okay over here we have a tall plant you know that pea plants are diploid right so for each character we are considering there's going to be two copies we call them two alleles height if we say is controlled by one gene each gene will have two alleles one allele that it receives from its maternal uh, gamete the other allele that it received from its paternal gamete so here since it's tall let's call it capital t capital t here it's dwarf it's called small t small t when you cross them this will produce gametes capital t this will produce gametes small t they will come together and form capital t small t when capital t small t is self when capital t small t is allowed to undergo self pollination you get let's draw a punnett square capital t small t capital t small t you get capital t capital t capital t small t capital t small t small t small t So if you look at the phenotype this is tall this is tall this is tall and this is dwarf So if you look at these genotypes you have capital T capital T capital T small t small t small t in the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 1 Now I can explain to you what homozygous and heterozygous means I'm sure you all know that we carry two copies of each gene one we receive from each parent right if both the copies are similar we say it is homozygous homo means what similar so if something is homozygous it means both are similar capital t capital t or small t small t both are homozygous if it is heterozygous it has to be different you will have dissimilar copies of a gene if it is capital t small t we call it hetero hetero means different one thing you must remember is whichever character appears in the f1 generation though both the traits were there in the parents tallness for tallness also there was 
uh, a copy for dwarfness there was a copy but only one of them showed up in the f1 generation whichever one showed up in the f1 generation that is called the dominant trait whichever failed to express in the f1 generation that is called the recessive trait okay recessive uh, condition or the genotype for the recessive trait is always going to be homozygous dwarf is always going to be small t small t but tall can either be capital t capital t or capital t small t but this is present inside the cell it is present within the dna it's not something that you can see and say okay this is homozygous this is heterozygous we can't do that is there a way we can find out whether a tall plant an organism exhibiting a dominant phenotype I told you here tallness is dominant, dwarfness is recessive, right? Now, if I have a tall plant and I want to find out whether it's homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant, is there a way I can do that? Without having to cut the plant, isolate its DNA and look at its sequence, can I do it alternatively with something more simple, something more easy to do? Yes, we can. And that can be done by another type of cross, which we call the test cross. So what do we do in a test cross? We are testing for something obviously. What are we testing for? Whether the organism that's exhibiting a dominant phenotype, whether it is homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant, we can check. Here's an example. Here we have a pea flower that is violet in color. We do not know if it's homozygous dominant or, wait, why is this W? We do not know if it's homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. So what do you do in such case? You cross this plant with a homozygous recessive plant. If it is homozygous dominant, if this is the genotype of this flower, then from this cross, all of the offspring that you get, all of the progeny that you get will be violet. If it is heterozygous, then in the progeny, you will get violet and white in the ratio 1 is to 1. All you have to do is take that plant, cross it with a plant that is homozygous recessive for the same character. If you get all dominant in the offspring, that means that plant that you crossed was homozygous dominant. In the offspring, if you get a mixture of dominant and recessive traits in 1 is to 1 ratio, then that means that was a homozygous, I'm sorry, heterozygous dominant plant. Okay. So that's about a test cross. Basically what we do here is if we have a dominant phenotype and we're not sure about a genotype, if you want to test whether it's homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant, all we have to do is just cross it with its recessive parent. Okay. So something that has homozygous recessive trait, if you cross it with that, you will get to know whether it's homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. Okay. Now let's move on and learn about what were the laws that he proposed based on his observations from monohybrid cross. Alright, so Mendel proposed two rules or two observations. He gave two observations or inferences based on his uh, monohybrid cross. One of them is called the law of dominance. It's also called the first law of Mendel. The other one is called the law of segregation, which we also call the second law of Mendel. What is Mendel's law of dominance or the first law of Mendel? According to Mendel's law of dominance, he says that characters are controlled by discrete units which are called factors. Back then, microscopy had not evolved much. You saw he worked in the 1860s around that time where microscopy was not that advanced. So people did not know about what chromosomes were, how do they function, what is uh, DNA, is that the genetic material? They did not know it back then. So what he said was, from his observations, he did not say that DNA or genes control these characters. He just said that there is something inside organisms, they are discrete units, they control these characters and he called them factors. Later we got to know that it's called genes. It's nothing but genes. Okay? And the second thing is, these factors occur in pairs. They are always present in pairs. Because one of them is received from the maternal gamete, the other one is received from the paternal gamete, right? 
Therefore, these factors will always occur in pairs. Whenever there is a dissimilar pair of factors, what is a dissimilar pair of factor? Dissimilar pair of factor means it is heterozygous in nature. Whenever there is a dissimilar pair of factors, for example, capital T and small t, one member of the pair dominates the other one. So, in the F1 generation, only one of them will express, the other one will not. We saw how in the previous cross that we studied, tall was expressed in the F1 generation, dwarfness was not to be seen at all. So, that is what he means by the third point. Now, what can we use this Mendel's law to explain? This law can be used to explain how only one of the parental characters appeared in the F1 generation like I already mentioned. What is the other law that he uh, proposed from his observations of the monohybrid cross results? It is the second law of inheritance. It's called the law of segregation. He proposed this rule or law based on the fact that alleles do not show any blending. What does that mean? Alleles are the alternate forms of a gene. Height is the character. Height can either be tall or it can be dwarf. The character height is controlled by a gene. That gene occurs in two different variants, so two different forms. Those different forms are tallness and dwarfness. Two different forms of the same gene are called alleles. Okay, so remember this. Based on the fact that alleles do not show any blending, whenever it is in a heterozygous condition, when you had tallness, dwarfness, both of them, it did not become intermediate height. It remained tall, right? It did not show any blending. That is what this means. And whatever parental characters were there, we recovered them as it is in the F2 generation, right? Though they were not visible to us in the F1 generation, in F1 generation, we saw all tall. It was not visible to us in the F1 generation, but in F2 generation, we got them. The dwarf character also back. Okay. So, Based on this observation, he proposed these points in the Mendel's law of segregation. Though the parents contain two alleles during gamete formation, they have two alleles during gamete formation. Gametes form from diploid cells, right? Two alleles are there. During gamete formation, the factors or alleles of a pair segregate such that each gamete receives only one of those. That is why it's called law of segregation. Each character, there are two alleles in normal diploid cells, but meiosis will happen during gamete formation. During gamete formation, only one of those two will get into the gamete. So it segregates during gamete formation. That is why it's called the law of segregation. Now, if a plant or a parent organism is homozygous. If it is capital T, capital T, or if it is small t, small t, all the gametes that capital T, capital T produces will be, will have T allele. All of the gametes that small t, small t will produce will have small t allele. But if it is heterozygous, having two types of alleles, in the gametes that this organism produces, there will be T in 50% of the gametes, there will be lower case T in the other 50% of the gametes. That is what this means. Alright? So, that's all about the law of segregation. Whenever gamete formation is taking place, even though in every individual there are two copies for each gene, during gamete formation, the two copies will segregate such that only one copy goes into each gamete. Okay? Now, that's about first law of inheritance, which was... Uh, based on his observations of the monohybrid cross. There we saw very clearly that, was no, uh, that there was no blending. When a tall plant was crossed with a dwarf plant, you got all tall plants. When a pure line violet flower was crossed with a white flower, you got plants that produce violet flowers. So there was no in-between lilac color, right? So here, different people started performing similar experiments by making use of different other organisms. One other organism they used was a plant called snapdragon. 
it's also called dog flower or anti rhinum species <coughs> excuse me over here they try to perform a mono hybrid cross by making use of this plant and the character that they chose was the color of the flower they choose two pure lines or true breeding varieties one of them produced red flowers the other one produced white flowers let's represent them with letters capital r capital r small r small r. since this is homozygous all the gametes that this will produce will be capital r all the gametes that this will produce will have lower case r once this artificial hybridization was performed they expected to obtain in the f1 generation either all red or all white because that is what happens one of those two will express whichever one is dominant that will express but to their surprise they got something different they got a whole new different phenotype which was pink neither of the parents are pink where did this come from now so this does not follow mendel's law of mono hybrid cross over there we said that there is no blending but here we can see blending what happens when you mix red color with white color in paint it becomes pink right so this is kind of like an intermediate shade between these two but it is an entirely new phenotype which was not present in the parents this type of inheritance is called blending inheritance or we also call it incomplete dominance over here you can see a deviation from the mono hybrid ratio that we obtained in Mendel's mono hybrid cross there we got phenotypic ratio 3 is to 1 genotypic ratio 1 is to 2 is to 1 over here you will get both genotypic and phenotypic ratio as 1 is to 2 is to 1 once these were self pollinated you see how there is one red capital r capital r if it's heterozygous it's going to be pink capital r small r and small r small r you have white all right so this is called incomplete dominance it's not necessary that every plant or every organism in nature for every character has to follow all of the rules that mendel said based on his observations on the plants that he took on the characters that he chose it is true but it does not hold good for every character in every organism okay so this is a deviation from mendel's mono hybrid cross okay so this is called incomplete dominance something similar can be observed in four o'clock plant as well which is called mirabilis jalapa now let's understand the concept of dominance we saw how in mo mono hybrid cross it was fully dominant and in di uh, in incomplete dominance it was semi dominant it was incompletely dominant right how does this concept of dominance work what determines whether the phenotype has to be dominant whether it has to show recessive type of uh, incomplete dominant type of inheritance how does this work okay so that's what we're going to learn here i already mentioned earlier in all diploid organisms there's going to be two copies of each gene which we call alleles alternate forms of genes are called alleles sometimes the alleles are similar where we call it homozygous sometimes they are different where we call it heterozygous usually what happens is one of them whenever it is different it is different because there has been some change that has happened at the molecular level in dna one of the alleles would have become modified it would have become modified in such a way that let's say if you have two alleles right now capital t small t capital t is the normal one small t is the mutated one some change has happened in the dna of this allele so it has become mutated so we say mutation has taken place now this normal gene which has which has retained its correct sequence which has not been changed will produce a normal enzyme that is required for some phenotypic expression let's say this one is modified it has undergone mutation and it has been modified now once it is modified there are three possibilities the modification or 
mutation might be very trivial, very small thing such that whatever enzyme is supposed to be produced, it is producing it, but it's producing it in a slightly modified way, which is less efficient. It's performing its job, but not as well as this. In that case, what will happen? It will act as good as this. Maybe slight difference is there, but there will not be any change in the phenotype. Or it could be non-functional. It is producing an enzyme, but that enzyme is not able to function at all. You can say that this less efficient enzyme is able to do its job, but it's a little slow. You can say it like that. If it's a non-functional enzyme, it cannot do its job at all. Or sometimes there are modifications that take place in genes which make sure that the enzyme itself is not produced. If it is this case, then there is no change. The phenotype will be as capital T. If it is this case, then the phenotype will differ. Phenotype will be affected. Okay. So, usually the dominant one is the one that has not undergone mutation. The ones that have been modified usually are recessive in nature. Okay. So, that's about the concept of dominance. Now, let's talk about something called co-dominance. One example for co-dominance is the AB blood group in humans. I'm sure you've learned about blood groups in your 11th grade chapter, uh, body fluids in circulation, right? So, what are blood groups? We have four different types of blood groups. There is A blood group, B blood group, AB blood group and O blood group. If the RBC membrane, plasma membrane contains the sugar A, then it's called A blood group. If it contains B, it's called B blood group. Likewise, you have A and B if it contains, it is B blood group. If it's O, it contains neither A nor B, right? Now, for the production of this A, B, A, B, these sugars also, we have certain genes in our body. One gene we receive from the mother, one we receive from the father. So, this blood group is also controlled by a gene which has two alleles. There are three different types of alleles for blood groups. They are IA, IB and lowercase i. The alleles are three in number. The phenotypes are four, which is A, B, A, B and O. There are six genotypes, which are given here. Okay. Now, if a person has A blood group, then the offspring, I'm sorry, if the person has A blood group, then the genotype can either be homozygous A or heterozygous A. Over here, IA, IB are equivalent. I is recessive, lowercase i is recessive. Since lowercase i is recessive, here also it will be A blood group. Similarly, for B blood group, it can either be homozygous dominant IB, IB or it can be heterozygous dominant IB. If you take O blood group, both are recessive, so it's homozygous recessive. But if you look at AB, this is what co-dominance is about. It's not about the any of the others. In co-dominant, uh, in AB blood group, you have IA, IB. Let me use a different color. Use blue. IA, IB. IA, IB. Over here, you have a dissimilar pair of alleles. What did Mendel's law of dominance say? Whenever there is a dissimilar pair of alleles, only one of them will express, the other one will remain recessive. In that case, here either A has to express or B has to express. But that's not what happens. Both of them will express simultaneously and you get AB blood group. Because both the alleles, though they are dissimilar, both of them are expressing, we say co-dominance. We call this co-dominance. Okay. So, whenever you're asked example about co-dominance and you should remember that co-dominance is 
seen in the AB blood group and not in the other blood groups. If you look at A blood group here, which is heterozygous, or B blood group here, which is heterozygous, in a dissimilar pair of alleles, only one of them is expressing. So, this is showing complete dominance. It's only AB blood group which shows co-dominance where both the alleles when they are dissimilar are expressing. Alright? Now, let's talk about multiple alleles. We know that for a gene, every individual will have two alleles. What are alleles? Alleles are different forms of the same gene. For example, when you consider eye color, I have two alleles for eye color. One I received from my mother, one I received from my father. So, my eyes are dark brown in color. But for eye color, there are so many different variations. There's hazel colored eyes, there's green eyes, there's blue eyes, there's black eyes and all of that, right? So, for the character eye color, there are so many different variations, there are so many different alleles. If any gene has more than two alleles for a character, we call that multiple allelism. We just saw it here, right? Over here, there are three alleles. There's IA, IB, I. So, there is more than two alleles there. So, that is an example for multiple alleles. ABO blood group is an example for multiple alleles. But if you have to study multiple alleles, you can't study them in individuals because individuals will have only two co copies. If you want to study multiple alleles, you have to study a population of many individuals of the same species. So, in order to study the effects of multiple alleles, we will have to study the populations. Okay? Now, let's move on and learn about... Yeah. Here, let me give you another important example. This is important and uh, students sometimes find it difficult to understand what this means. Sometimes what happens is, one gene produces one gene product, one protein, let's say. That single gene product can have more than one phenotypic effect. For example, there is a gene that controls starch synthesis and pea seeds. This gene exists in two forms, capital B and small b. Whenever the pea plant has capital B, capital B, starch synthesis is very good. It's very effectively happening. And whatever starch grains are produced, they are large in size. This is the size. Okay. And the shape is round. This is the shape. So, if it's capital B, capital B, homozygous dominant, it's large in size and the shape is round. If it is lowercase b, lowercase b, they are very less efficient in starch synthesis. The starch grains produced are very small in size and they have a wrinkled appearance. So, the size is small and the shape is wrinkled. Now, if you consider the heterozygous trait or the heterozygous uh, condition, you can see that they have intermediate ability to produce starch grains and whatever starch grains are produced are of intermediate size. Size is intermediate and shape is round. Over here, if you consider the size, you have large, you have intermediate and you have small. If you consider the shape, there are only two possibilities. Either they are round or they are wrinkled. Now, both these characters are controlled by the same gene, B. Okay, over here, can you say that this gene is showing complete dominance like Mendel? Or can you say that it is showing incomplete dominance? What do you think is the correct answer? If you consider size as the character, it is showing incomplete dominance. Because you have an intermediate character, there is some amount of blending that you see here. You have a large grain, small grain, intermediate size grain like we saw in that snapdragon flower. But if you consider the character of shape, you have round and wrinkled only two. So, round is dominant, wrinkled is recessive because in the heterozygous, round has expressed. We cannot say that a gene is showing complete dominance or incomplete dominance 
it will depend on which is the character that you are considering. Okay. So, dominance is not an autonomous feature of a gene. A gene can not be dominant or incomplete dominant. Which is the character, <coughs> excuse me, that we are considering? It will depend on that character. Okay. So, dominance is not an autonomous feature of the gene means this you should remember. Okay. This is, this is an important line for you to understand. Now, let's move on and talk about inheritance of two genes which we call the dihybrid cross. In a dihybrid cross, di means two. Two characters are considered. Here they have given illustration of two characters with respect to the seed. Which are the two characters? One is the shape of the seed. The other is the color of the seed. Shape of the seed can either be round or wrinkled. The color of the seed can either be green or yellow. Over here, round is dominant, wrinkled is recessive. Here, yellow is dominant, green is recessive. Since he is taking two characters, each character has two alternating forms or uh, alleles, you can see four letters here. First, he takes double dominant, round and yellow and crosses it with double recessive, wrinkled and green. When he gets offspring, all of them will be round and yellow. That is why I said round is dominant, yellow is dominant. This is the first step. I told you, in every step, he selects pure breeding uh, varieties or pure lines. Next, he performs cross-pollination. Whatever you get is the uh, F1 generation. You allow that to undergo selfing. You will get four different combinations. Earlier, we had started off with the parents had the parents were round and yellow or wrinkled and green. This is the parent. In F1 generation, you had all round and yellow. But if you look at F2 generation, you have round and yellow, wrinkled and green and you have round and green, wrinkled and yellow. This, these two are new combinations. In the parents, anywhere before, you have not seen this combination. Round with green, wrinkled with yellow, you have not seen it before. All you have seen is round with yellow, wrinkled with green. In the F2 generation, he obtains new combinations. He calls them recombinants. And whatever combinations were there in the parental generations from the beginning, they are called the parental types. Over here, you will get the phenotypic ratio 9 round and yellow, 1 wrinkled and green, 3 round and green, 3 wrinkled and yellow. So, the phenotypic ratio that you get is 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. Over here, there are 10 parental types and 6 recombinants.
what this indicates is that whenever two characters are considered the inheritance of one character or the segregation of one character during gamete formation will not depend on the other if they were tightly linked we would not have gotten newer combinations the fact that we got newer combinations ind indicate that during gamete formation the pair of alleles that control one character will not interfere in the segregation of the other character right so based on this he proposed his third law of inheritance which is called the law of independent assortment so what does the law of independent assortment state the law of independent assortment states that when two pairs of traits we consider two pairs of traits one is shape one is color when they are combined in a hybrid the segregation of one pair of characters is independent on the segregation of the other pair of characters if they were both linked and together the combination newer combination would have not been possible because it is possible we say that they are independent okay now that is about um mendel's work he performed all of these experiments he gave out all of these rules based on based on his observations he published his work basically i think in 16 uh, 1865 okay so in 1865 he published his work for many years his work did not get recognized at all it did not get the appreciation that it deserved at all due to some reasons the reasons are mentioned here it was recognized again in 1900 but until then for over 30 years his work was not recognized why because back in the day communication was not easy mass media was not there it was not easy so he could not publish his work to a large audience secondly he said that whatever is controlling inheritance occurs as discrete units called factors many people did not believe in that because he said that they do not blend if there is no blending then how can one explain so many variations in nature right if you consider the skin color of humans it doesn't come in either black or white there are so many shades of it if there is no blending then how can you explain something like that right so because of that also his contemporaries did not accept the explanation that characters could be controlled by discrete units called factors which did not show any blending the third reason is that like i already mentioned he used mathematics to explain biology most people could not understand it because it was very new for them like i mentioned he is the first person to have done it nobody had done it before it was not familiar to a lot of people so they did not quite understand what he was trying to do the fourth time is uh, i'm sorry the fourth point is he said that there are certain factors that are responsible for governing how inheritance takes place but he could not prove what they were he did not know if it was dna whether it was present in the chromosomes physical proof he could not provide for those factors which is why many people dismissed his studies okay so these are certain reasons now in the year 1900 three scientists from three different parts of the world hugo de rice carl corins and von schirmach they rediscovered mendel's work 30 years later they rediscovered mendel's work for as long as he was alive he did not even know that his work is of so so much importance and people till today we study about his experiments right so yeah much later these three people independently rediscovered his work and by then microscopy had pretty much advanced a little bit and people were also studying about how chromosomes behave during cell division especially during uh meiotic cell division which is reductional division that happens during the production of gametes why it was important because people wanted to study inheritance it happens from parents to offspring it happens through gametes during gamete formation meiotic cell division takes place so they were trying to work out how do the chromosomes behave during meiosis once that was worked out people tried to correlate how the chromosomes behave during meiosis and how the factors that mendel believed in behaved mendel also said that the during gamete formation they segregate dissimilar uh, what is it called whenever more than one character is considered in a hybrid in a dihybrid independent of the one the other one will segregate 
assortment will happen independently. So they try to draw similarities between movement of chromosomes or the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis and whatever Mendel said about factors. And they finally concluded that whatever factors that Mendel mentioned are nothing but genes or DNA that are present in the chromosomes. And then is when we got the chromosomal theory of inheritance. Basically, it's a theory that was proposed to explain how inheritance happens via chromosomes. So making chromosomes as vehicles, inheritance will take place. So this is basically a graphical representation of what happens during meiotic cell division. You've learned that in detail in 11th grade. So I think it's pretty easy for you to understand this, right? Now let's move on. So uh, yeah, this was by this was done by two people, Sutton and Bovary. But they did not perform experiments to prove this. Experiments were performed by another person called Thomas Hunt Morgan and his co-workers. One of them was Alfred Studewart. He was also very important. I'll, I'll get to it in a little while. So the, this person performed experiments. And he concluded that the chromosomal theory of inheritance is true. Genes are in the form of DNA, they are located in the chromosomes and that is what is responsible for inheritance. So the experimental proof was provided. That theory was validated by the work of Thomas Hunt Morgan and his co-workers. Okay. So based on his work, we discovered the basis of variation during sexual reproduction. Okay. So for his experiments, he used an animal, he used an insect which we call the fruit fly in layman terms. But its scientific name is Drosophila melanogaster. You know, when you keep uh, bananas uh, out in the open, with, if it's not covered, if it's uncovered, then you see small black flies flying around it, right? They are these flies called fruit flies. Its scientific name is Drosophila melanogaster. What are the reasons why he chose this for his experiment? This is an important question for your board exams. They could be grown on simple synthetic medium. Whenever you're growing animals or bacteria or whichever organism, for research, you will have to provide that organism with the nutrients that it requires, right? Because it cannot go hunting for food. It's in the laboratory. If you want them to survive so you can use them for your experiment, you have to give them whatever food it needs. What food it needs is given in the form of a nutrient medium. The nutrient medium that these flies required was very cheap and it was not very difficult to make. So he used this as, that is one of the reasons why he used this as his experimental organism. Next. Their lifespan is very short. They complete their entire cycle in about two weeks. Just two weeks, they hatch and uh, they finish reproduction also within uh, 15 days. So their life cycle is very, very short. That is one of the reasons. Why should it be important? Because you're studying inheritance. How from one generation to another generation characters will get passed on? If you have to study that, if the lifespan is like humans, if it is like 100 years, 70 years, then nobody is going to be alive to check what happened between two generations, right? The shorter the lifespan, it is easier for us to understand how inheritance works. So that is one advantage we had with Drosophila melanogaster. Next, one single mating could produce so many progeny flies. So the number of organisms that you get in the progeny is also high. So your data will be more credible and you can analyze better. Per mating, if you're getting one offspring, two offspring, you can't really draw any conclusions from that, right? So a single mating could produce a large number of progeny, which is another advantage. And there was a very clear differentiation between two sexes. The males and the females were easily distinguishable by just using a, a simple microscope also. So that is another reason. And it has so many different types of hereditary variations that you could study. Just like how Mendel um, studied so many characters in pea plants, there were many variations that you could see in Drosophila also which could be studied. So these are some of the reasons why he chose Drosophila as his experimental organism. Okay, now what did we get to know from his results? He performed dihybrid crosses by making use of these flies. For the dihybrid cross, you have to consider two characters. He knew for sure that the two characters that he considered were on the X chromosome. Similar to humans, even in Drosophila, the females have two X chromosomes. And the males have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So both the characters that he considered were present on the X chromosome. 
most children get overwhelmed by looking at these images. These are nothing but very simple representations of a dihybrid cross. What you're looking at here are two chromosomes. This band here represents the location of that particular gene governing the character. In the first cross that he performed, he considered two characters, which was the body color and the second one was eye color. The body color could be yellow or brown actually, but here it's given wild type. <coughs> the eye color could be white or red. Okay. So, wild type is the unmutated, unmodified one. Whatever has been modified is the uh, yellow and white. So, over here, when you are representing it in the form of letters, how we did previously, whichever was dominant, you took that as capital. Whichever was recessive, you took it as lowercase, right? Capital T, small t, you took uh, lowercase for recessive, capital T as dominant. What he does here is, he takes the letter of the recessive one, which in this case is Y. Y is recessive. Y plus is dominant. W plus is dominant. So, to the recessive uh, letter, you add a superscript plus that will make it dominant. So, that's what you're looking at here. Here you have female, here you have male. In female, two X chromosomes. So, this is like a diploid condition. Here it is just one X chromosome. So, when he performed a dihybrid cross with this, he noticed that the parental types, parental type, remember what I said? Whatever combinations are present in the parent, same combination has to be present. Yellow and white as it is. Wild type as it is. There should be no recombination. Yellow with this W plus, W with Y plus, that recombination should not have happened. It should be in these combinations itself. That is called uh, parental type, he got 98.7% of parental type, which is almost 99%. And the recombinance that he got was about 1.3%. What does that indicate now? This is a deviation from Mendel's dihybrid cross. In Mendel's dihybrid cross, out of 16, you got 10 parental types and you got 6 recombinance. My math is very poor, but I'm sure that 10 out of 16 is not 99%. So, here the parental types are less compared to the parental types here. Over here, if you consider the ratio, 10 is to 6 is the ratio for parental types and recombinance. Over here, you can see how almost 99% is recombinant itself. Not many, 99% uh, is parental type itself. Not many recombinants are produced. What could be the reason for this? The reason is simply that the two genes that we are considering are present on the same chromosome and they are placed pretty close to each other. Whenever genes are present on the same chromosome, we say that they are linked. Linkage is the term that you use to represent how genes on the same chromosome are interconnected. Whenever genes are present on the same chromosome, usually the recombinant number percentage will be less and the parental types will be more. The closer the two genes are located, higher is the number of parental types. If there is a more distance between these two, then the recombinant, formation of recombinant, the chances will increase. Okay. So, we got to know that from his experiments, dihybrid cross experiments, making use of uh, drosophila. He performed a similar dihybrid cross using two other characters, color of the eyes color of the eyes, it could either be white or wild type. This is eye color and the other one is wing. Wing could be normal which is wild or miniature which is mutated. When he performed a similar cross using these two characters, he noticed that the parental types this time were 62.8%, which is almost 63%, and the recombinant percentage was 37. Point, I'm sorry, 37.2%. 
So here again there is a deviation. You can see how mostly it is parental, very little recombinant. Here it is 62% parental, 37% recombinant. Here also it is a deviation from Mendel's law because it's not following the 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 ratio. The reason being they are still linked. They are located on the same chromosome which is why you are getting a higher proportion of parental types. Why you are not getting as much as 98.7 here is because look at the distance between these two. More distance between the two genes considered, greater is the recombinant type. Lesser the distance between the genes considered, more will be the parental type. So this indicates that the genes that are located closer to each other in the same chromosome, on the same chromosome, are more tightly linked compared to the genes that are located quite distantly. By making use of these kind of information, we can also, you know, um, create a genetic map on which chromosome what gene is present, how much distance that does that gene have from another gene. So, these kind of studies you can make. Okay. So, over here you can see here is the position for uh, eye color. Here is the position for body color. Here is the position for wing. So, you can make that that kind of mapping. That was in fact done by one of uh, uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan's students called Alfred Studeward. He is one of the people who pioneered in genetic maps. Okay. So, that's about it. Now, let's move on and learn about something called polygenic inheritance. The name itself says it all. Polygenic inheritance means one character is controlled by more than two genes. At least three genes have to be there that control one character. Poly means many, right? Three or more genes controlling one character is called polygenic inheritance. Over here, in such a case, you will not have two distinct alternate forms. And you can see that there is a gradient. Example for that is our human skin color. Height is also example. If you see in humans, height is not like two different alternate forms only, right? It's not like six feet and four feet people. You have 5.3, you have 5.4, you have 6.2, you have 5.8. So, you have different heights people. So, it's a gradient. Skin color, it's not like black people, white people only. You have so many different beautiful shades of skin color. We Indians are beautiful chocolate brown. So, how does that variation or how does that gradient happen? Uh, such traits are controlled by three or more genes. Usually, such a type of inheritance will also be influenced by the environment. Let's take the example of skin color to understand this. I said that skin color is controlled by at least three genes. Let's take three genes, capital A, capital B, capital C. It exists in two forms. It's either dominant or recessive, dominant or recessive, dominant or recessive. Whenever an individual has greater number of dominant genes, darker will be the complexion. Whenever a person has less number of dominant genes, lighter will be the complexion. For example, what is the maximum maximum number of dominant genes? 6. So, if all of them are dominant, that is the darkest skin color. If all of them are recessive, uh, okay, so this is incorrect. This has to be capital A, capital A, lowercase b, lowercase b, lowercase c, lowercase c. If all of them are recessive, that will be the lighter skin color. If it has three dominant and three recessive, it will have intermediate skin color. You can have five dominant, one recessive, five recessive, one dominant, four dominant, two recessive, so many different combinations in this. Over here, it does not matter whether A is dominant, B is dominant or C is dominant. It only depends on the number. This skin color, wait here, you have three dominant and three recessive, will be the same as A, A, B, B, C, C. It matters only how many of them are dominant, how many of them are recessive, which is why we also call this qualitative, I'm sorry, quantitative inheritance. It depends on the quantity or the number of genes that are dominant. Because in such cases, more than one gene is controlling a character, you have so many different varieties. We have so many different beautiful colors of skin shades. Okay. So that's about polygenic inheritance.
Next we have pleiotropy. Pleo pleiotropy is like the opposite of polygenic inheritance where a single gene is controlling more than one phenotypic expression. So a pleiotropic gene is one gene that exhibits multiple phenotypic expressions. What is the mechanism for this? The mechanism is that one gene will produce a product, okay, which is responsible for a metabolic pathway and that metabolic pathway will contribute towards different phenotypes. One very good example for that is phenylketonuria. It is a genetic disorder. We learn about it later also. So what happens in this disease is a gene is mutated. The gene that is mutated codes for an enzyme called phenylalanin hydroxylase. If this one single gene is affected, this single gene will control many uh, phenotypic expressions such as mental retardation, reduction in hair and skin pigmentation. All of these are different effects, but it is responsible. What is responsible for these effects is the same gene which codes for enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase. Okay, so how exactly this happens, you learn about it later. What I want to try to tell you here is pleiotropy is when one gene is responsible for more than one phenotypic expression. Alright, now let's move on and talk about sex determination. Okay, so there have been various crazy theories about how sex is determined. Whenever you have some free time, you should go just browse the internet and see how what people used to think about sex determination. Ba basically what sex determination is, um, what determines whether a baby is going to be a boy or a girl. So Aristotle had some crazy theories about this and then he used to say that the heat of the male uh, during the mating period will indicate whether it's a boy or a girl and there are so many such bizarre theories. Uh, but later, eventually we got to know that it's chromosomes in humans that determine uh, sex. I'm sure you know by now that uh, we have 46 chromosomes, 44 of them are autosomes and there are two sex chromosomes, a pair of sex chromosomes in both males and females normally. Females will have two copies of X chromosome, males will have a copy of X and a copy of Y, right? So, if sex determination is happening because of chromosomes, we call that chromosomal sex determination. In your syllabus, you have a couple of different types of sex determination to study about. Let's begin by talking about the XX, XO type of sex determination. Over here, this type of sex determination can be observed in several insects such as grasshoppers. What actually happens here is, there's only one type of sex chromosome which is X, okay. So O here is not a sex chromosome. What does O mean then? O is the absence of the sex chromosome. In this case, the males will have only one X chromosome. Females will have two X chromosomes. So when the male produces the gametes, it will either have the X chromosome or it will lack the X chromosome. When the male produces gametes, it will definitely have the X chromosome because it has two X. Okay, so here you can see that the male will produce two types of gametes, one set of them, 50% of them will have the X chromosome, 50% of them will not have the X chromosome. Since males are producing two types of gametes, we call this male heterogamety. Hetero means different, I already told you, more than one. Now, let's study about the XX, XY type. We see this in humans and you also see them in some insects like Drosophila. Just when I told you about Thomas Hunt Morgan's experiment, I told you that we, he was studying Genes that were located on the X chromosome, I also mentioned how the males there have XY and the females have XX. So what basically happens here is, over here, the males contain X and Y, females contain X and X. So males will produce two types of sperms containing X or containing Y. Females always produce eggs that have X chromosome. Alright, so here also males produce two types of gametes, so it's called male heterogamety. In some birds like chicken, you can see ZZZW type. Over here, the females have two types of X chrom uh, sex chromosomes Z and W, while the males have ZZ. Females will produce two types of eggs, either carrying Z or either carrying W, while the males will produce always the chromosome, uh, the gamete that has Z. So here it is female heterogamete. All these three are examples for chromosomal determination of sex. We have another stunning type of sex determination that we see in honeybees, which is very, very interesting. It is called haplodiploidy. In honeybees, whether a, hun whether a bee is male or female is determined by the number of sets of chromosomes it has. If it is haploid, it is male. If it is diploid, it is female. So, 
a female queen bee is the one that reproduces always. It will be diploid and it will have 32 chromosomes. This female will undergo meiosis to produce cells, egg cells that have 16 chromosomes each. If this egg cell parthenogenetically develops into a male, the male will also have 16 chromosomes and the male will be haploid. Males have 16 chromosomes, they are haploid. They will produce sperms by mitosis. Sperms are haploid. When the sperm fuses with the egg containing 16 chromosomes, you get the female that contains 32 chromosomes. So basically what's interesting over here is, the males never have a father. Males are directly produced from the mother. Males can never have sons because sons always come from the mother only. But the males can have grandfathers and they can produce grandsons. How interesting is that? So that's about haplodiploidy. Now let's talk about mutations. In detail about mutation you learn in, you learn in the next chapter called uh, molecular basis of inheritance. Here we'll just briefly brush through it. You know that DNA genes contain DNA. DNA has the information in the form of a nucleotide sequence which will produce a protein. If the sequence of DNA is altered, the sequence of amino acids in the protein will be altered. So if there is any alteration in the DNA sequence, it will change the subsequent protein. Whatever job that protein is supposed to do, that job will be affected and as a result, it could result in the changes in genotype as well as phenotype of an organism. One thing you must remember about mutation is we see so much variation in a population, right? People have so many different heights, eye colors, hair texture, skin color and all of that. That variation is mostly because of what happens during sexual reproduction and meiosis during crossing over in the pachytene stage of prophase 1 genetic material will get exchanged. That is what is one of the reasons for these variations. Another reason for variation is mutation. Whenever there is any changes in the sequence of DNA, that also can bring about variation in a population. Alright, now let's talk about pedigree analysis. What is pedigree analysis? I'm sure you've heard of the term pedigree with respect to dog food, but what is a pedigree analysis in genetics? Um, whenever you have to kind of understand the inheritance of any trait, if it's a plant or if it's some insect, you can perform crosses and understand it. But in humans, you can't intercross and find out how any character is being inherited, right? In such cases, we make use of pedigree analysis where we study the entire family's history, which in which generation, which are the people that showed that trait? Do their children have it? How is it getting inherited from one generation to another? So we analyze the traits in several generations of a family and that is what we refer to as pedigree analysis. So in a pedigree analysis, we study one particular trait over the course of several generations and we represent that in the form of a family tree. So why is that important? In human genetics, it provides a very strong tool which is used to trace the inheritance of specific traits it could be any abnormality or it could be any disease. You, you want to study the history of a disease, you can do a pedigree analysis. Okay. So here are some symbols that are used in pedigree analysis. If it's a male, it's represented by a square. If it's a female, it's represented by a circle. If the sex is unspecified, they can't remember in that generation who had which child, whether it's a male, female, then sex is unspecified. If they are affected, they are shaded, they are solid. Uh, mating is indicated by this horizontal line. If there is mating between relatives, uh, consanguineous marriages we call first cousins getting married, immediate rel relatives getting married, that is represented by two lines between a square and a circle. Parents above and children below. Okay, yeah. So parents are usually represented above. So this is a male, this is a female. They have gotten married and they have had two children. The first child is the daughter, the second child is the son. This is what it represents. So you have to uh, draw this according to the order in which they were born from left to right. If the child is affected, then you just shade it. Uh, this will show, if you're just writing a number there, it just means that 
that many children were there but they were not affected okay now it's time to learn about genetic disorders i'm sure you've learned or heard about genetic disorders sometimes in your families you may have noticed why somebody is suffering from a disease they say okay it's genetics it's heredity they've got it from their parents or something like that so it's possible to inherit diseases as well just like you can inherit property from your parents you can inherit diseases and disorders also from your parents or from your relatives so that is uh, genetic disorders there are two different types i mean categories of genetic disorders one is called mendelian disorders and the other one is called chromosomal disorders let's first understand what mendelian disorders are okay so whenever there is mutation in a single gene a gene controlling a particular character a particular trait whenever there is a mutation in one gene and that causes a disease it's called mendelian disorders how this gets inherited from one generation to other follows the same rules of mendelian inheritance so that's why we call it mendelian disorders how can we get to know what kind of pattern it's following we can get to know it by the pedigree analysis what are some common mendelian disorders hemophilia cystic fibrosis sickle cell anemia color blindness phenylketonuria thalassemia all of these are examples of mendelian disorders some of which we'll discuss going forward so these alleles that are responsible for causing the disease they may either be dominant or they may be recessive sometimes they are even present in the sex chromosomes where we say they are sex linked disorders so it could be present on the autosomes in which in which case we call it autosomal disorders if it is present on the sex chromosomes we call it sex linked disorders if it's specifically present on the x chromosome we call it x linked disorder it could be dominant it could be recessive if it's present on an autosome and if it expresses in its dominant uh condition then we say autosomal dominant if it's autosome present on the autosome and expresses when in recessive we say autosomal recessive similarly we have x linked dominant x linked recessive uh, y linked inheritance all of that is there all right now yeah uh here one example that we have is color blindness wait here is an example of how pedigree analysis is done okay you can take a look at it and try to understand what exactly this is so here is a family tree starting off with parents see this is the mother this is the father mother is affected father is normal they have 1 2 3 4 5 children first is a daughter second son third son fourth no wait this is not a daughter they have four children this is again daughter the third son married another woman they have all normal children the last daughter married a man she has a daughter who has the disease so by understanding the pedigree you can try to understand or find out what kind of inheritance is it is it uh, x linked is it autosomal is it dominant is it recessive all that you can find out by going through and analyzing these pedigree charts now let's talk about color blindness color blindness is sex linked it is present on the x chromosome the genes that are responsible for color blindness is present on the x chromosome what is color blindness one type of color blindness is when people fail to recognize the difference between red and green colors why does that happen because the rods and cones responsible for red and green color perception they are affected usually this occurs in 80% i'm sorry 8% of males and about just 0.4% of females but i just said it is an x linked disorder females have two x chromosomes males have only one x chromosome shouldn't it be like more frequent in females and less frequent in males if you see here i mentioned that it is a sex linked recessive disorder we females have two x chromosomes if both of them have the recessive allele which is mutated which is responsible for color blindness only then we will be color blind if we have one allele that is a uh, recessive and the other one that is normal this will make up for this this will produce the normal rods and cones and we can see color but for males that does not happen they have only one x and one y even if one x is defective allele then they will be color blind that is why the percentage of males being color blind is greater than the females being color blind so males basically have only one chromosome and the females have two 
if the son uh if a woman is a carrier for that gene she carries that gene i'm sorry here yeah this is a carrier if a woman carries that gene but she herself is not affected if she has children then the son will have 50% chance of getting color blindness because one of her x chromosomes is going into the zygote if a mother is a carrier then the son that she will probably have if she has a son and every time she has a son there is 50% of chance of that son becoming color blind but if she has a daughter and if that daughter has to be color blind then the mother if she is a carrier the father also has to be color blind for that daughter to be color blind if the father is color blind xcy and the mother is carrier then there is 50% chance of the daughter to be color blind okay a daughter will not be color blind unless her mother is a carrier and her father is a color blind why do we call this carrier because that individual is not affected he functions normally she functions normally because she has one normal allele but she still carries a defective allele that's why we call it carrier this defective allele can be transmitted to her next generations to her sons to her daughters so that is why we call it a carrier next we have hemophilia hemophilia has something to do with blood clotting this also is sex linked this also is recessive so this is because of the defect in one of the genes that will produce a clotting factor a protein required for blood clotting for blood clotting you need, require so many different proteins of those proteins one of the proteins that is absolutely required the gene for that is present on the x chromosome because that x chromosome is defective that protein is not being produced because that protein is not being produced blood clotting will not take place for minor cuts also they will end up bleeding for a long period of time okay so that is what happens in hemophilia a sing and in, in an affected individual a simple cut will result in non stop bleeding over here also since it's x linked the heterozygous female she will not show the symptoms because there's another normal allele that will make up for the defective allele but she has the ability to pass it on to his son to her son if a female has to be uh, hemophilic then the father has to be hemophilic and the mother has to be a carrier similar to what i said earlier so next we have sickle cell anemia sickle cell anemia is a recessive disorder but it's autosomal the chances of people getting sickle cell anemia is equal in both males and females what happens here anemia is when oxygen transportation is not happening happening properly hemoglobin is defective hemoglobin is what will transport oxygen throughout the body right if hemoglobin is not functioning properly if the number of hemoglobin is less in that cases it will result in anemia so this is autosomal linked recessive disorder what happens here is when both of the parents are carriers for that gene or when they both heterozygous then it can be transmitted from the parent to the offspring now this is controlled by just one gene which has two alleles hba and hbs hb for hemoglobin s superscript indicates sickle cell a is normal if an individual has hbs hbs homozygous recessive then they will show symptoms of the disease if an individual is heterozygous dominant they are not affected this a there is a defective allele hbs but hba is present so it will make up for it they will produce normal hemoglobin also if they are both hba hba homozygous dominant then they are going to be normal what exactly happens in sickle cell anemia let's understand you know that hemoglobin has four polypeptide chains two alpha two beta what happens in these individuals is the beta globin chain the beta chain in hemoglobin that will be modified the gene that codes for that at the sixth position instead of having a codon for glutamic acid it will replace that by valine so in the mrna instead of gag there will be gug at the sixth codon position that codes for the sixth amino acid 
So in a normal polypeptide, at the sixth position, glutamic acid has to be there. But since the gene is defective, it has undergone mutation, a point mutation at one location. Instead of GAG, there is GUG. A is replaced by U. Because of that one point mutation, glutamic acid will be replaced by valine. So what happens then is that, so what happens then is that, under low oxygen conditions, whenever there is uh, not sufficient oxygen, the hemoglobin molecules will start coagulating within the RBC and the RBC that is supposed to be like a biconcave shape will become sickle shaped. That is why it's called sickle cell anemia. Okay. Next, let's talk about phenylketonuria. In phenylketonuria, it is also an autosomal recessive trait. This is uh, a, an error in metabolism. We've already discussed this under uh, pleiotropy, right? So what happens here is they lack an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase. Why is this phenylalanine hydroxylase important? It is the enzyme that is used to convert an amino acid phenylalanine into tyrosine. Because this conversion does not happen, phenylalanine will get accumulated and it will get converted into phenylpyruvic acid and some other derivatives. If this phenylpyruvic acid gets accumulated in the brain, it can cause mental retardation. Sometimes because it's not absorbed by the kidneys, it will get secreted, excreted through urine as well. That is about phenylketonuria. Next, let's talk about thalassemia. This is also a type of anemia which is autosomal recessive. Uh, wherever both the parents are carriers for this, it will get transmitted to the offspring. This can happen either because of a mutation or a deletion which results in reduced synthesis of globin. What happened in sickle cell anemia? Hemoglobin was getting produced, but the beta globin chain was not normal. Quality was not good. Here, the amount of globin chain synthesis is reduced. Here, quantity is not sufficient. Okay? So, that will result in anemia, which is one of the characteristics of this disease. You have two different types of thalassemia, alpha thalassemia and beta thalassemia. This depends on which globin chain is affected. If the production of alpha globin chain of hemoglobin is affected, it's called alpha thalassemia. If it's beta globin chain, it's called beta thalassemia. So what is responsible for the production of alpha globin chain? There are two genes, HbA1 and HbA2. Both of them are closely linked and present on the 16th chromosome. If any of these four alleles are affected, then it will result in thalassemia. More number of alleles infected or affected will mean uh, more severe the disease. In beta thalassemia, beta globin chain is coded by only one gene, HBB, which is present on chromosome number 11. Even here, if both the alleles are affected, it's worse. If one of them is affected, it's better. Okay, so that's about thalassemia. Now let's talk about chromosomal disorders. We've covered everything about Mendelian disorders. Chromosomal disorders are caused due to either an increase or decrease in the normal number of chromosomes if there is an abnormal arrangement of chromosomes. Whenever there's more or less than a normal number of chromosomes, we call it aneuploidy. Euploidy means proper number, correct number, normal number. Whenever chromosomes segregate during cell division, if the segregation does not happen properly, some cells will have more chromosomes than the others. That will result in chromosomal disorders. Examples, Down syndrome and Turner syndrome. In Down syndrome, they have three copies of chromosome number 21. Usually, we have two copies of every chromosome. But people that suffer from Down syndrome, they will have three copies of chromosome number 21, which is why we call it trisomy 21. In Turner syndrome, there is one chromosome less. This happens in females where they have only one X chromosome. Okay. What is polyploidy? Polyploidy is having more than two sets of chromosomes. Normally, we are diploid. If after karyokinesis, cytokinesis does not take place, then the same cell will have more sets of chromosomes. Then it will become polyploid. We usually don't see this in animals. You can observe this in plants. Okay. We have to discuss three disorders. Down syndrome, Klinefelter syndrome and Turner syndrome. What is Down syndrome? It is called Down syndrome because it was first described by Langdon Down in the year 1866. This can occur in both males and females because it is the autosome, chromosome number 21 that is affected. It has three copies of chromosomal uh, 21 which is why we call it 
uh, trisomy 21 we have no uh, normally we have 44 autosomes and two sex chromosomes they have 45 autosomes and normal X chromosomes. There is no difference or variation in the number of sex chromosomes. What is affected is the autosomes. What will happen as a result is the individuals that suffer from Down syndrome have short stature. They have a small rounded head. They have a furrowed tongue. Their mouth is partially open. The palm is very broad with a characteristic palm crease and physical development, psychomotor development and mental development is also retarded in such individuals. Now let's talk about Klinefelter syndrome. This is caused only in males. Over here, there is an extra X chromosome. They are born phenotypically as males. They have normal number of autosomes, which is 44. They have, if they are normal males, they should have XY, but they have an additional X, which is why it, it is called XXY syndrome also. So they have an additional copy of X. Because they have an extra X chromosome, they have certain uh, feminine features as well. Overall, their development is masculine. But some of them develop breasts similar to females, which is called gynecomastia. And uh, individuals that have this kind of karyotype are usually sterile. Finally, we have Turner syndrome. This is caused only in females. They have normal number of autosomes, but only one X chromosome. The other X chromosome is absent. This is caused because of the absence of one of the X chromosomes. Similar to how Klinefelter's males are sterile, Turner's females are sterile because their ovaries are not developed, they are rudimentary. They also lack other secondary sexual characters that we see in females like the development of breasts, uh, widening of the hips, all of that also does not happen in people who suffer from Turner's syndrome. So this was all about the chromosomal disorders. So with this, we have come to the end of today's lecture. It was lengthy, I agree. It was informative also, right? So hopefully this session has helped you understand all concepts of genetics clearly. So prepare yourselves well for your board exams and the entrance exams. Until I see you next, take care of yourselves, stay healthy and keep smiling.